good whenever this is, which I don't know. Not legal advice. Like, subscribe, share, comment. Show your plants. Show your animals. Please share. Thank you for watching. Always. It's always appreciated. I was going to tell you a joke about boxing, but I forgot the punchline. What do you call a pony with a, with a sore throat? A little horse. And last but not least, but not last for your benefit, I was going to tell you a time-traveling joke, but you guys just didn't like it. Anyway, I have a few things I was going to talk about briefly. I'll start off with the SEC. Uh, I saw there was an article in Bloomberg, I believe, that said the SEC was paying short sellers and short and distort reporters. That's my language. They were paying them as whistleblowers. So they were consulting these guys, many of, many of which we believe are ripping us, off, ripping us off. They were consulting these guys. And when the information led to whatever, maybe to a prosecution, they were paying these whistleblowers money using public funds. How do you like that? So they're going to the guys who we think are ripping us off and using our money to pay them to give potentially false information. Um, I have a problem with that. Beyond that is, what is the logic here if they have a claim against any of these people? So let's say there's a criminal complaint against somebody who's paid whistleblower fees by the SEC and it relates to a securities issue. How is the SEC going to justify and claim that the person they gave $14 million to is a scumbag and should not be trusted? So I don't think it's very wise that they deal with people that they might have to either prosecute, uh, penalize, discipline, et cetera. It makes no sense. It also cuts them off from discipline. It also suggests impropriety. It's certainly a conflict of interest. So I find that appalling, but consistent with the way the SEC, FINRA, et cetera, have operated. So literally, they may be in bed with the criminals. You know, we've talked about it, but here they're actually financing and funding potential criminals. I'm not going to name any names because I don't know who's responsible, but we've obviously discussed many names during uh, my videos and my live streams with JR and everybody else's. So you know who they are. So it's appalling. And uh, so I'm just going to leave that at that. Uh, if anyone has any conversations with the SEC, this is a, a important topic to discuss what, how they justify excluding these guys, basically making these guys immune. Because how are they going to prosecute somebody they pay for information? Uh, on top of that, I saw also that and there was a reference to the calendar. It's a little aside, and I'll speak about it in more detail later. But apparently all the failures to deliver after they're more than five days old, they go to a, um, to the, uh, I forgot the name of it, but it's the, the Obligations Warehouse. That's the name of it. And basically they get repriced, hidden, burned, or whatever. And again, the regulators are aware of this. They're involved. They're manipulating the system. They might be engaging and, and facilitating criminal conduct. So shouldn't the DOJ, the Secret Service, et cetera, be monitoring this? That goes also with the SEC paying, paying the shorts money. Shouldn't the DOJ and the uh, IRS, Secret Service, be monitoring all these people to see, see if there's legitimate activity or whether there are cronyism going on and people being paid for what they should not be paid for. Anyway, so that's that. Next, I wanted to talk about briefly about the steamroller petition. I referenced it in the live stream we did on Sunday night. So this is a petition that's filed in New York. It's filed against the OTC. The petition is under a New York statute that lets you, before filing a complaint, to obtain the names of defendants if you have a valid claim. Uh, and you can't obtain the names of those defendants. And in this case, Steamroller is an LLC, uh, a, a form of entity in, in uh, Florida, located in Florida, who have an interest in Series A 
uh, shares of MMTLP. That's their standing. They filed an action or going to file an action and, and filed this petition in New York where they're seeking to get the names of defendants of those parties, the hedge funds, market makers, brokers, whoever, that helped facilitate the original trading of MMTLP in October of 2021. And so this petition is before the court. Court issued a hearing date today of December 14th. Uh, the OTC will have an opportunity to oppose the petition and then uh, steamroller through counsel of an opportunity to reply. And then a hearing will be held on or about December 14th. And depending on the outcome of that hearing, whether the court needs additional information, a ruling will be issued either on that time or sometime thereafter. And if uh, Steamroller is successful, they may get the disclosure of the names of those potential defendants who operated to make MMTLP tradable that might affect MMTLP, MMAT, and a bunch of other tickers. It, it remains to be seen. Uh, but I compare this to the prior petition that was filed that's now on appeal. I think this one has a much better shot of being granted. I think it comes much closer to the intent of the statute because nobody can find out the names of these parties. Nobody's willing to give up the names. And so it seems particularly appropriate. And in this case, the fraud claim, I think one of the claims of fraud claim, in essence, that these parties filed false documents, didn't obtain approval, et cetera, and acted fraudulently in getting... Uh, uh, the MMTLP to trade. So I happen to think that this petition has, at least if we're in my court, this petition has a much better chance of being granted. Again, that's steam steamroller. Um, and again, you know, the reason the statute is very specific, it only discloses defendants, not the facts giving rise to the liability. And that's kind of where it differs from the prior claim that's on appeal. That petition the information might have gone to the more to the claim as opposed to the identity of, I think, 105 brokers is what they asked. We probably know who those 105 brokers are. But in this case, we don't really know who those defendants are who started the trading because the Form 211 form's not there and the documentation has not been presented. So be interesting to see how that goes. A hearing again is December 14th. Additional documents will be filed as they're filed. I'll certainly comment on them as I see them. I saw a Third topic, I saw a class action filed regarding MMAT in Nevada, the local councils in Nevada, but the law firm that's handling it, I think it's the Pomerantz firm, is located in New York. I didn't really spend a lot of time reviewing it. Uh, oftentimes, class actions, it takes them a long time before in their position of knowing whether they're going to go forward or not. It might take a year and a half or two years, something along those lines. This was filed, I believe, in September of 2023, so it's really early in the ballgame. I know for my myself, I would probably opt out of it because I'm suing Fidelity in arbitration. So my claims are being adjudicated right now. I don't know how other people, what they should do. Obviously, they should seek their own counsel and seek, uh, seek counsel from somebody they trust. Um, just my particular, I'm not a big fan of uh, class actions, but again, uh, that might be at some point in time, maybe the best remedy. Everybody has to make that decision. And again, seek counsel from somebody you trust and make an informed decision. Again, my situation is, is pretty specific and different because I'm in a action involving fidelity in arbitration. So that basically takes the place of the claims that would be pursued in arbitration. I also don't know if I would have standing in that arbitration. Uh, not everybody would have been a original holder of the Series A share. Timing might make a difference. I don't know who the parties were going to be, but it doesn't really apply. And I didn't really look at the substance. And until the case gets much farther down the line, we really don't have a way of evaluating the merits. Um, I expect in almost all, for all uh, situations involving companies like MM MMAT, MMTLP, that there will be class actions filed. It's kind of nature of the beast. Uh, most of them go by the wayside, um, but that's kind of the nature. I don't, I don't, I don't conclude that just because it's filed, it has any validity. So uh, I don't have any opinion on the validity, just that it won't impact me. And I will comment once I have a chance to look at it and when I see 
what's going on, how it's pursuing. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was I saw today a couple of things that I found really interesting. In in 2022, there was a court, I think in Georgia, that found Wells Fargo had conspired with FINRA as to the arbitration selection process, namely that they excluded or included certain arbiters per a secret agreement with FINRA. And a trial court, a lower court, found, agreed that there was such a uh, agreement. It went up on appeal and the appellate court for various reasons found otherwise, but pretty amazing uh, these findings, because that mean there was, there was a trial and there was evidence presented and the judge could conclude from the evidence that there was an agreement whereby they excluded certain arbiters. Now in my arbitration, one of my objections is the arbitration selection process. And one of my objections about the process is they have some non-disclosed system of how they choose the arbiter, arbiters. I have three arbiters. It's some kind of algorithm, but they don't disclose the algorithm. Of course, I asked for them to disclose the algorithm, but they refused and I have ob objected. So consistent with this case, I find the selection process of arbiters that FINRA undertakes is incomprehensible and lacks complete transparency. Secondarily, so that's my pitch, and it was interesting how it fit within the, the finding, the Wells Fargo finding being in concert with FINRA in terms of the selection of arbiters. And separate and apart from that, there was a case in Alabama, and I didn't see any appellate case, but there was a case in Alabama, also in 2022, in which a arbiter, a FINRA arbiter again, and all, I'm, all these arbiters are appointed by FINRA, they're supposed to meet the qualifications of FINRA, they're supposed to be qualified, unbiased, etc., was found to have committed fraud in the case. What he did was, apparently there was a broker from Merrill Lynch that was had a bunch of charges against him. The judge, arbiter, apparently had some agreement and expunged these charges. Expunge means, means got rid of them so they wouldn't appear on this guy's record anymore. Somehow they were able to find it and track him down. Another very qualified, competent, well-established and moral FINRA regulated arbiter. Full, fully facetious there. Anyway, that's all I have for right now. Hope that uh, provides a little color for you and see you soon. Have a great night.